Tomorrow, December 29, we will be heading to the National Assembly where there are two very important pieces of legislation that will be debated. The first being the Natural Resources Fund Amendment Bill and the second, the Local Content Legislation. Well, in studio with me at this time, I have the Senior Minister in the Office of the President with responsibility for Finance, Dr. Ashni Singh, as we discuss both pieces of legislation and also specifically the Natural Resources Fund Act since there has been a lot of persons uh, in media spaces having several discussions about it. Thank you so much for being here with me, Dr. Singh. Thank you very much, Travis. It's a great pleasure to be here as uh, always, and particularly in anticipation of the very important sitting of the National Assembly, um, which we'll be having tomorrow and to which you uh, referred in your opening remarks. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I want us to, first of all, let's talk a little bit about the local content policy. I want us to uh, perhaps discuss it for the benefit of Guyanese, exactly what it means for Guyana, where will it take Guyana? Sure. So the Local Content Bill is an extremely important piece of legislation and it represents the first time that local content legislation will be considered and approved in the National Assembly. It represents the culmination of an accumulation of efforts that uh, started since we assumed office with uh, the president constituting a local content advisory panel, including international experts who, and of course local representation, who together came up with a local content, a draft local content policy. And that pol draft local content policy then informed the local content bill that's now um, before the parliament. Um, the bill sets the stage for Guyanese nationals and Guyanese uh, companies and business entities to participate in a meaningful, uh, a truly meaningful way in the new and emerging oil and gas sector. As you know, one of the, you know, amongst the main concerns in any country where there is a, uh, a new um, extractive sector, like a new oil and gas sector, um, amongst the many concerns that one will typically encounter are issues such as, or questions such as, whether the rest of the domestic economy, the non-oil economy, so to speak, whether the rest of the economy will have an opportunity to participate fully and be able to benefit from the oil and gas uh, sector. We gave a commitment as a in the first instance as a party out of government during the 2015 to 2020 period, we gave a commitment that we will put in place a legal, a strong legal framework to ensure responsible and sustainable management of the oil and gas sector and a framework that will ensure that the benefits of this sector will redound um, to all of the people of Guyana. That includes, of course, essentially uh, a strong local content framework what this local content bill does is it sets out in a number of sectors, so it carves out a number of sectors um, or categories of goods and services to be supplied into the oil and gas sector. And it requires the oil and gas sector to procure a minimum percentage of their inputs for each of these categories from Guyanese uh, companies. So what that does is it introduces an obligation, a legal obligation, on the part of the oil and gas companies to source their goods and services from local providers, from Guyanese providers. So that automatically creates business opportunities for Guyanese companies and Guyanese nationals. And of course, in support of achieving that objective, it establishes, the bill establishes a number of critical institutional prerequisites. These include things like a local content register for procurement opportunities, um, a local content register for employment uh, employment opportunities. So you'll have Guyanese companies and Guyanese nationals registering, being entered on the register. It requires mandatory procure public pro, uh, com and competitive procurement by the oil and gas companies, um, which will mean that Guyanese companies and Guyanese nationals will have opportunities to know what the procurement um, uh, you know, what future procurement uh, uh, opportunities uh, are available and therefore to compete for that business. Um, 
and it includes an accountability and report an administrative accountability reporting framework including things like um, the preparation of local content uh, um, plans by the companies the establishment of a local content secretariat um, which will administer um, these registers the local content registers which will ensure the compliance by the oil companies with the, um, the minimum thresholds etc so it's really a very exciting piece of legislation like i said if you scan the schedule to the bill as most people would have done i'm sure you'll see that in a number of sectors it stipulates that the oil and gas companies must procure and their contractors must procure a min a minimum percentage um, no less than a stipulated percentage of their inputs for each of the sectors that are listed. The companies must procure no less than the stipulated percentage of their inputs from Guyanese nationals and Guyanese companies. So it sets the stage for, you know, full and meaningful participation by Guyanese nationals and Guyanese companies in, in the oil and gas sector. And that, of course, in turn will result in... Um, you know, business opportunities for Guyanese businesses and Guyanese nationals, opportunities uh, for them to invest and expand, to take advantage of those opportunities, the opportunities that are being created. It'll result in job uh, creation. Um, and also, of course, you know, it creates an incentive for research and uh, development and te technological innovation by Guyanese companies to take, to position themselves, to take advantage of the uh, minimum local content requirements that the, the oil companies are now required mandated to comply with. So it's an it's a very very uh, you know I would say it's a it's a momentous day in the economic history of Guyana mm. because it you know it this bill really you know sets the stage for the or, or establishes the bridge between what's happening in the oil and gas sector and what's happening in the non-oil economy and sets the stage for you know meaningful and indeed full and rewarding particip full and rewarded participation by the non-oil economy service providers guidance or goods and service providers so it's a very very it's i would you know i would go so far as to say it's truly it's a truly historic piece of legislation and um and and um you know, sets the stage for what i believe will be a very exciting period for Guyanese nationals and Guyanese companies. Thanks for that, uh, Minister. You mentioned there the opportunities that will be created with successful passage of this legislation. Can we talk a little bit about how exactly it will transform the Guyanese economy? Do you see this legislation really stimulating more growth for businesses, perhaps even the GDP of the country? Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, right now, there is no local content legislation in place so the oil and gas companies and their contractors are essentially completely free to procure all of their inputs a hundred percent of their inputs from anywhere in the world so every input that they require from a paper clip to an fpso vessel right now there is no impediment against them procuring every good and service from outside of the Guyanese economy. There's no requirement that says that they must procure a minimum percentage of their goods and services, the inputs to their operations from Guyanese companies. That doesn't exist right now. What this law says, or does, it identifies a series of goods and services listed in the first schedule to the bill so it lists each one of them you know legal services financial services accommodation um you know etc it lists these and it attaches to each one a percentage and what that percentage stipulates is that the oil companies and their contractors are required to comply with that minimum percentage meaning that they must procure let's say for a particular sector let's say for i don't know let's say for a particular category of inputs they have a minimum requirement of 70 percent what that means is that 70 percent 
of all of their inputs in that category must be sourced from Guyana. So that immediately creates a business opportunity for Guyanese producers of goods and services. Because the oil companies now, they may still source the remaining 30 from outside of Guyana, but the 70% would have to be sourced from within Guyana. So instantaneously a business opportunity is created. And so that in turn will of course translate into Guyanese businesses will obviously respond to those opportunities because then you know the entire Guyanese private sector is looking at this schedule and they're thinking to themselves they're examining it and they're thinking to themselves you know some of them are already operating in those sectors and they're thinking to themselves well now I have an assurance that 60 percent or 50 percent or 20 percent of all of the inputs into the sector have to be bought from Guyana so I now have an opportunity or I have an enhanced opportunity to compete for that business and be able to get that business. Um, and for businesses that are not currently operating in the sector, including potential Guyanese investors who are looking at this schedule and they're saying, well, you know, in this particular sector, at least 70% or 80% of the inputs for the oil and gas companies in this category will have to be sourced from Guyana. I'm a Guyanese national or I'm a Guyanese company. How do I position myself to be able to produce that good or service? in order to be able to take advantage of the opportunity that has been created by this minimum percentage that the oil companies are now um, obliged to source from within Guyana. So it creates opportunities not only for existing Guyanese nationals and existing Guyanese businesses to be able to capitalize on the fact that now there's a minimum percentage of goods and services that must be procured locally, but even for new and emerging Guyanese businesses who want to look down the road and not you know, you don't have to look too far down the road because once the legislation comes into operation and the schedule becomes effective, then the opportunity lies before you. But f even for future Guyanese, you know, Gu or Guyanese businesses and Guyanese nationals who are considering future investment opportunities or future business opportunities, they can look at the schedule and say, well, you know, these are areas where I have expertise or these are areas where I have an interest in investing in. And the oil and gas companies are now required or obliged to buy a minimum percentage of goods and services locally. So I will position myself. This is the Guyanese national or the Guyanese company, the average Guyanese national or the average Guyanese company saying to themselves they can now position themselves to be able to capitalize on that business opportunity. And so, you know, it, it, it assures in a number of sectors, it assures a certain minimum level of inputs being purchased from Guyanese nationals and Guyanese companies. That immediately translates into increased domestic production because it's Guyanese producers who will be producing these goods and services to supply to the oil and gas sector. And that in turn translates into improved incomes, jobs, um, etc. Et so it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it has a very direct impact on the business opportunities that are available to, um, to, to Guyanese companies and, and nationals. It has a very direct and positive impact. And it's a very exciting, like I said earlier, it's a very exciting, um, very exciting and positive thing. Yes. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Natural Resource Fund Act. Uh, could we first start the discussion with highlighting under the previous administration what existed, now what the PPPC administration is proposing and why it has, I know we are transforming as a country. Uh, the president speaks a lot about mm -hmm. our agenda towards that transformation. Was that also a uh, factor that led to the amendment? And also, why, why was it necessitated at oh, this time? Absolutely. Um, and so, the, you're absolutely correct that you, tomorrow will be an extremely important day in the parliament, um, because not only will we be considering the local content bill, but we will be considering a second and uh, at least equally important bill, which is the Natural Resource Fund Bill. You quite rightly highlight, Travis, that in fact the APNU AFC government did uh, take to Parliament a piece of legislation uh, which was subsequently enacted in response to your question about what existed um, you know, under the previous administration. Let me highlight first of all that 
while the APNU AFC did take a natural resource fund bill to Parliament, the consideration of that bill took place very importantly after the no confidence motion had been passed in Parliament. So the no confidence motion was passed in Parliament, as everybody knows, in December 2018. In January 2019, having lost the no confidence motion in December 2018, in January 2019, having lost that no confidence motion, the APNU AFC nevertheless forced through that the parliament. Mind you, the passage of a no confidence motion under the constitution is supposed to trigger a sequence of events. The parliament is supposed to be dissolved, the cabinet is supposed to resign, and elections are supposed to be held within 90 days. That that's you know that's been amply ventilated and is now you know very widely known. The then APNU AFC government did not do that, did not comply with the requirement to dissolve parliament, resign as a cabinet, dissolve parliament and call an election. Instead, they forced through parliament a natural resource fund bill that was passed, like I said, in January and that was subsequently assented to by then President Granger. And I highlight that really to make the point that the bill, therefore, has a fundamental problem in the very fact that it was passed through Parliament during a time when the Parliament should have been dissolved and at a time when the government should have been in caretaker mode and at a time when the, the then opposition, the People's Progressive Party, having won the no confidence motion or having secured the approval of the no confidence motion, said very clearly that we will not participate in illegitimate in the proceedings of an illegitimate parliament. So by the mere fact of forcing this piece of legislation through parliament in January 2019, when they should have been in caretaker mode preparing for an election and when the parliament should have been dissolved, by virtue of that fact and that fact alone, the NRF Act, that the APNU AFC left in place suffered a very fundamental problem, a very fu a fatal defect. Now, if we were, even if we were, and you know, there are many who will argue very persuasively and um, convincingly, and you know that that defect alone renders the bill um, uh, in, inoperable. But let us, for argument's sake, put aside the fact that the bill was forced through the Parliament after the no-confidence motion was passed. Put that aside for a moment. The contents of the bill, which then became the Act, the contents themselves suffered very significant defects. And I'd be happy to elaborate on those if you would like me to and if time would permit, because, you know, when we were considering how to proceed with this matter, we had to consider whether we should discard the entire Natural Resource Fund Bill uh, ha Act and come up with a new enactment or whether we should just address the sections that were defective and there was a lengthy debate and discussion on this and I will say that you know while there was a lot that was significantly defective about their act we took the conscious decision that we didn't want to discard it in its entirety but given that it suffered this defect that we would have to repeal and reenact it, but we took the conscious decision that we would attempt to retain some elements of it that were not, at least in the current moment, not so fatally defective as they, they couldn't be operationalized. So what we're seeking to do in the NRF bill that we've brought to Parliament is we're seeking to repeal and reenact the NRF bill retaining quite a few sections that were there before 
but addressing the most fundamental defects, the most fundamental defects in that old framework, at least to make the framework operable. And so this bill does just that. And this bill contains a number of very significant enhancements relative to the old act, the APNU AFC Act, which I'd be happy to elaborate. You are permitted to. Very good. Thank you very much, Travis. So we, even in opposition, had identified a number of issues that were fundamentally problematic with the APNU AFC NRF Act. And I want to mention a few of these which we have now sought, which we are now seeking to, 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 to repair. The first is the fact that the governance framework contained in the NRF Act is virtually, well, I said contained in the NRF Act. Perhaps a more appropriate formulation is that there is no governance framework in the NRF Act, the APNU a AFC NRF Act. But perhaps I should say that the governance framework was extremely weak. So what do I mean by this? It's standard practice that sovereign wealth funds should have some kind of governing board. In fact, it's standard practice that companies mind you, this sovereign wealth fund is a large entity, will be managing the entire pool of the country's oil and gas resources. If you set up a small company, you have to have a board of directors. The law requires you to have a board of directors. Astonishingly and bizarrely, the Sovereign Wealth, the Natural Resource Fund Act that the AP and UFC passed did not provide for a board of directors. There's no reference to a board of directors anywhere or a governing board or a governing council. There, there is no such thing. We set up small entities. We set up, you know, Geology and Mines Commission, Forestry Commission, um, you know, uh, and we, we have small regulatory bodies and, and we appoint a board of directors to administer, to oversee and administer the operations of these entities. But here the APNU AFC was setting up a natural resource fund that had no board of directors. So you may then ask the question, who or what would have been performing the functions of the board, the functions that are traditionally vested in the board of directors, who or what or which entity would have been performing those functions? Unbelievably, considering the importance of the fund, all of those functions under the APNU AFC NRF Act, all of those functions were vested in the Minister of Finance. The Minister was responsible for the overall management of the fund. The Minister was responsible for the preparation and approval of the investment mandate. The Minister is responsible for executing the operational agreement with the Central Bank for operational uh, aspects related to the management of the fund. The minister is responsible for appointing the macroeconomic committee. The minister is responsible for determining the economically sustainable amount. The minister is responsible for calculating the fiscally sustainable amount. The minister is therefore responsible for determining how much will be transferred from the fund to the budget. And the list goes on. Those are just a small sample. The minister is responsible for appointing the staff. The minister is responsible for com recruiting the company, the, the, um, any ad advisory comp. The, uh, the minister was vested with all of the functions that are traditionally vested in a governing body of some sort. Now, we made this point. The then opposition leader, now vice president, said very clearly that he was alarmed at the pervasiveness of the powers of the Minister of Finance in this bill. That he made that point as opposition leader at the time, that the powers, the roles, responsibilities and powers that were given to the Minister of Finance were excessive and that the act suffered and the architecture that was developed suffered the fundamental defect of overreach 
by the minister into every aspect of the operations of the fund. So our amendments seek, first of all, to address that defect by, in the first instance, dramatically reducing the roles, responsibilities, and powers of the minister. Dramatically reducing those roles, responsibilities, and powers. So we have all of those roles. I shouldn't say all, but most. Several of the roles, the bulk of the roles, responsibilities, and powers we have taken away from the Minister of Finance. And it is a People's Progressive Party civic Minister of Finance who is going to Parliament and who is saying those powers should not vest or rest with the Minister of Finance. And we are making provision for those very functions to be performed by a board of directors. And that board of directors will not be appointed by the minister. So the board will not be, you know, an, an, artifact, an, an artifact of the minister. The board of directors, in fact, is going to be appointed by the president. And there are minimum stipulations regarding the composition of the board and qualifications for membership of the board, including the fact that the board should include a representative from the private sector, the board should include a nominee from the National Assembly. Um, and, you know, the law is very clear about that. And so what you have here is you're moving. So firstly, the, the, the bill does that addresses that fundamental defect, removing the powers of the minister and introducing the requirement of a board of directors where you once had the minister as the all powerful autocrat exercising all powers, roles, and discharging all roles, responsibilities, and exercising all powers, where you had under the APNU AFC configuration, this all-powerful minister, we have removed from that act this all-powerful minister, and we have inserted a board of directors, a five-person board of directors. The mere fact that you're moving from one person to five represents an improvement. The mere fact, set aside if it wasn't the minister, or put aside who, whether it was the minister, or put aside who is appointing the board of directors, the very fact that you're moving from a point where you had one individual performing these functions to a panel of five persons, by mere virtue of the fact that you've moved from one to five, that constitutes improvement. But add on top of that, that this is not just five random persons, it's five persons appointed by the president, meeting certain requirements with representation from key stakeholders. So we have dramatically strengthened the governance architecture. Secondly, the APNU AFC Act included a public accountability and oversight committee with representation from a wide range of civil society organizations. I think it was a 22 member committee. Now, understand what was being done here. This is very clever. Having vested all of the powers in the minister and having created this all powerful entity called the minister who would exercise all of these, make all of these decisions. What the APNU AFC Act tried to do is to create the smoke, uh, some kind of smoke screen to create the impression that there would be accountability. And so they established a public accountability and oversight committee comprising, like I said, 22 members. To begin with, that configuration was designed for deadlock. First and foremost, just to get 22 persons into a room. And I mean, we all live in the real, we live in the real world. Just to get 10 persons in a room to agree on a view is a challenge. Much less to get 22 persons from disparate organizations, different stakeholder representative um, bodies and so on, civil society bodies and so on, to get 22 persons, just to get them to be available to be in a room and to form a co single coherent view, you can imagine the challenges.
you can imagine, imagine the challenges. You can, you know, if you brought five, par five persons into a room, you'd have a challenge arriving at, you know, it wouldn't be an easy task to get five persons to agree on a single view or to form a single coherent um, view. But a large, cumbersome, deliberately, I believe, large and cumbersome 22-person public accountability and oversight committee was convened, put together, to create the smoke screen that there's a governance mechanism. But this body was not making any decisions in relation to the governance of the fund. So make no mistake about it that the Public Accountability and Oversight Committee is not a substitute for the Board of Directors. They're not performing the functions that would traditionally be performed by a Board of Directors. They're doing some exposed evaluation of the um, of the management of the fund, they are doing some public consultations on the uses of the fund, etc. So they are giving, given some functions, but they are not given the function of being responsible to manage the fund. So this was done entirely as a smokescreen. The establishment of this big 22 member public accountability and oversight committee was done as a smoke screen to create the impression that there is some kind of governance architecture when in fact there was none. So what the APNU-AFC Act did was a very clever thing, very devious thing I would say, vest the Minister of Finance with all of the power, no board of directors, vest the Minister of Finance with all of the power and then set up this public accountability and oversight committee, put every stakeholder group imaginable onto the committee and give them powers that had nothing to do with the actual management of the fund. They're just like some kind of exposed oversight body. We already have several exposed oversight bodies. We already have several such bodies, including the parliament itself and the parliamentary select committees. We already have the parliamentary economic services committee and the parliamentary natural resources committee and the public accounts committee that are already performing exposed par oversight on behalf of the parliament. So, like I said, this was a very, I don't believe it was done by accident. Because having designed the bill in such a way that the minister had all of the power, they had to create the smoke screen. And so the PAOC was nothing but a smoke screen to create the impression that there was a governance architecture. So what we have done is, and, and they were given functions that, that many of the functions that were given to the, P, the, the, the Public Accountability and Oversight Committee make no sense whatsoever. And I can come back to why those functions make no sense. I will deal with that tomorrow in the Parliament if, if I don't have an opportunity before that. So what we have done is, first of all, we have streamlined the PAOC, the Public Accountability and Oversight Committee, to bring it down from 22 to a more manageable a more realistic number. I think we have nine. You know, nine is still a large number, um, but we have brought it down to nine. We include representation from the religions. We include um, uh, representation from the private sector, representation from labor, representation from the professions. So it's still a very broad-based, you know, uh, and widely representative uh, commit, uh, committee. And we stream, streamline its functions to make those functions more relevant to and more, uh, in fact, uh, you know, to factually reflect what an oversight committee would be involved in. We give that committee overarching responsibility to exercise non-governmental oversight over the fund. So we remove this smoke screen that the APNU AFC tried to do to create the impression that there is good, good governance. We remove that smoke screen. And we put in place a board of directors responsible for overall management. And we put a public accountability and oversight committee responsible for non-governmental oversight. And we're crystal clear about that allocation of responsibilities. So we clarify the allocation of responsibilities. The third major uh, uh, amendment that we're seeking to do relates to the formula for transfers from the fund to the budget. So the APNU-AFC Act defined a 
mechanism for determining the formula. Incidentally, that mechanism had the minister's fingerprints all over it. So under their mechanism, you had a number of concepts that were introduced. You had something called an economically sustainable amount. That amount, incidentally, was determined by the minister. He receives recommendations from a macroeconomic committee, but he's not bound to follow those recommendations. He determines. Then you have a second concept called the fiscally sustainable amount. Here again, who do you think determines the fiscally sustainable amount? The minister again. And you have a, an elaborate schedule to the act that defines how the minister might go about determining the fiscally sustainable amount. And that schedule, once again, is designed to be, is essentially a smoke, another smokescreen. It's another smokescreen. Because it defines a formula that is so complex that the average Guyanese, and in fact, you know, even Guyanese reading this with expert eyes, would have tremendous difficulties deciphering what that schedule is saying and what exactly the formula is to determine the fiscally sustainable amount. You know, I've seen a lot of commentary over the last few days, you know, on how much money is going to be withdrawn from the fund. Well, the beauty is that under the, our bill, anybody can calculate how much is going to be transferred from the fund. That amount is co completely transparent. Everybody knows it. Anybody can calculate it. All of the people who are offering comments on the amount that's going to be transferred from the People's Progressive Party civic formula as contained in our bill, I challenge any one of them to articulate what the amount or tell us what the amount would have been under the APNU AFC formula. It was designed, the formula was designed, it was designed to be obscure. It was designed to be opaque. Opaque is in fact a better word than obscure. It was designed to be opaque. So that nobody, you have to be a rocket scientist plus a brain surgeon, plus maybe a Nobel Prize winner to be able to decipher what is written in this schedule. And like I said, what, even when you read it, and I'm sure that you know, if you take your time and you read it closely, you will eventually decipher it. But even when you decipher what the formula is seeking to do, you are still held hostage by the fact that most of those amounts are determined at the judgment of the minister. And there are several opportunities for ministerial judgment to be introduced. Ministerial judgment is introduced at the level of the economically sustainable amount. Ministerial judgment is introduced at the level of the fiscally sustainable amount. Ministerial judgment is, is introduced in relation to benchmark petroleum revenue and production constrained benchmark um, petroleum revenue. So there are multiple levels at which ministerial discretion can be introduced and at which ministerial discretion can be used to manipulate the amount that's going to be transferred from the fund to the budget. We have removed that. We have removed all of those opportunities for manipulation. And we've put a formula there that every single Guyanese person can read and understand. And that is transparency. Transparency is also about understandability. So we have removed the opacity, the lack of clarity the incomprehensible nature of the APNU AFC formula. We have removed that and we've introduced a simple, understandable, clear, and therefore transparent formula for transfer that will govern transfers from the, um, from the fund to the budget. And if I might mention one final point, we take further steps. So that alone is an important step in relation to transparency. In fact, if I may make two further points. Then, fourthly, we strengthen the reporting requirements. As you, you recall that the AP and UAFC tried criminally to conceal the fact that they had received criminally and, 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 and I can't even think of you know, appropriate words to describe it. 
what they tried criminally to conceal the receipt of 18 million US dollars worth of signing bonus and all manner of um, excuse, uh, attempts were made to conceal this bonus. And at the time, the opposition leader, now vice president, said very clearly, we will ensure that we put in place a legal framework that this can never happen again. That no government will be able to conceal receipts into the fund or attempt to conceal receipts into the fund in a manner that they did. And so we have introduced now in the law the obligation that every single receipt into the fund, every single receipt into the fund, shall be published in the official gazette, and that notification published in the official gazette shall be tabled in Parliament. And we've written that into the law. And we've written furthermore into the law that the Minister of Finance, who is responsible for doing that, should the Minister of Finance fail to do that, he will be criminally liable including to imprisonment. And we strengthen the custodial um, uh, term associated with that, uh, with non-publication. Non my final point will be the following. But, but my final point, you know, subject to any further questions that you might have. What we also do with this NRF bill is we ensure that all spending, all spending will be determined through the budgetary process. So on the one hand, we simplify the formula that will govern how much is going to move from the fund, the NRF, to the budget. And that amount, when it moves to the budget, it goes into the consolidated fund. And it is appropriated by the parliament and it is subject to parliamentary scrutiny. So every dollar that is spent is determined by the parliament. So the government will not unilaterally be determining how to spend and how much to spend. The parliament will be determining that as a part of the budgetary process, as a part of determining budgetary priorities. The parliament will have an opportunity to scrutinize that spending ex ante during the consideration of the budget and ex post during the consideration of the Auditor General's reports and the deliberations of the Public Accounts Committee. And so there's no th this question of how the money is going to be spent. The money is going to be spent through the budgetary process and subject to maximum parliamentary scrutiny. And so we have ensured that that is in place. And so I could go on. I will pause there for a moment because you know, I'm, you know I, I'd like to address any further questions that you've had. But I would say that on the whole, if you'll permit me, I'd say that on the whole, Travis, with all of those amendments, there are a number of other things that we've amended uh, which, are, which are critical too. Um, but those are a few major highlights that I want to mention which ensure that what we have in place is a significantly enhanced natural resource fund and a significantly enhanced architecture for the governance, management, and oversight of the fund. And the NRF bill does precisely that. Minister, you referenced earlier about things that you have been seeing in the public domain regarding spending. But we've also seen some persons, specifically civil society groups, coming out and asking for a postponement of this discussion tomorrow. They have also referenced that it is unreasonable uh, to have such pieces of legislation in just eight days to be considered. Uh, how would you respond to those comments? And I know you spoke about it being ensuring greater transparency, but to add to that, what benefits would the average Guyanese be able to see once these amendments are made? Well, I could be facetious and I could ask that very group to share with the country and the world at large what their views were when the APNU AFC scheduled a sitting of parliament in January 2019, having lost a no confidence motion, scheduled a sitting to consider a bill as important as this and forced it through parliament. I could be facetious and ask what that very group's views were in that moment 
when having lost their no confidence motion, the APN UFC, AFC went ahead and enacted their act. But I won't do that for the time being. I will say that in fact what we are, if one took the time to study what this bill does, one will see that quite unlike what they did in 2019, which was an original piece of legislation that they pushed through Parliament at a time when they had no legitimacy as a government, what we are doing here represents, first of all, I think commendably, if I might say so myself, we have actually preserved significant parts of that original bill, of that act. We could have easily discarded it and said, you know, everything, you know, like what they did, discarded everything that, that they inherited and, you know, that wanted to start everything back from scratch. We, we didn't discard everything. In fact, if one took the time to study this bill, lay it side by side, this bill with their act, you'll see that significant parts significant parts of this bill are a perfect replication of what was in the act. So this is not an original piece of legislation that is coming for the first time. The overwhelming majority of this bill, like I said, only those sections that were fatally defective have been amended. The overwhelming majority of the, of the rest of the bill has, has, uh, of the rest of their act has been retained. As a matter of fact, hilariously, I have seen people, some of the commentators, criticizing some elements of the bill that are a perfect replication of the act that was there before. And that alone demonstrates for you the opportunistic nature of some of this commentary. I've seen people criticizing things in the new bill that are a perfect replication. It was there before, exactly the same move from the old act to the new bill, and they're criticizing it. They didn't, had no problem with it in 2019, but they have a problem with it now. So my response would be that the bill does not represent, if you put it side by side with the old act, it doesn't represent a new enactment. It addresses, like I said, four or five fundamental issues that are not rocket science to comprehend. You don't need to cogitate for a year on whether the minister should have excess powers. As a matter of fact, if we had written in and retained those excessive ministerial powers in our new legal framework, that very group would have attacked us. But they don't seem to have a problem when those powers vested in an APNU AFC minister. And so there are four or five critical issues that are being addressed in the bill. Like I said, the governance architecture and the issues are very simple. Reduction of ministerial powers, introduction of a board of directors, and streamlining of the composition and role of the Public Accountability and Oversight Committee. That's not rocket science. It's a very simple, straightforward streamlining. The question of the, um, the formula for transfers, very simple and straightforward, not rocket science again. The question of improving transparency, here again, not, not rocket science. The mechanism for spending, which is, was, is largely, in fact, a preservation of what existed before, again, not rocket science. And so, to those who are hopping on this small bandwagon, without even studying the bill, I say that is most regrettable. Pause for a moment. Pause for a moment. Put the two pieces of legislation side by side, read them side by side, and examine and you will see in fact that a lot of what was there before has been retained, right? Even if it was imperfect, even if in our deepest moments of reflection we thought to ourselves, you know, this could have been done differently and a little bit better. We thought to ourselves in the first instance, let us not discard this in its entirety. Let us work with it but address the most fundamental impediments and correct them so that we can make this NRF operable, make it operational. Now, you ask the question, you know, what, what delay, you know, what does the delay mean or, or, or the avoidance of the delay? What would the avoidance of the delay mean for the people of Guyana? Well, 
you know, regrettably, you can't, you, there's an old saying, I think they say, you can't, what is, you can't eat your cake and have it, or you can't, you, know, you can't eat, 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 yes, I think you can't have your cake and eat it, or something like that. There is a very legitimate call for an accelerated development agenda to be implemented. That call reflected itself. No, no, uh, 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 you know, nowhere more clearly than in the results of the 2020 election. There's a clear and perfectly valid and understandable call for an accelerated development agenda. Many of these very stakeholders are calling on the calling for the proceeds of the Natural Resource Fund to be deployed for development. And many people were saying this money is being saved and it is not being used to promote national development. Well, you can't do so unless you put in place an, an operational but robust and transparent architecture for managing the fund. And so we gave a commitment that until we address the fundamental flaws, pre no less a person than President Ali, no less a person than, pre than President Ali, gave a commitment that we will not touch this fund until we strengthen the architecture for managing it. He said so publicly. He said so before he became president and he said so after he became president. And so addressing these fundamental defects in the architecture is a critical step prior to us moving to the point where proceeds can move, can withdrawals can move from the fund to the budget and can finance the very development programs that are being called for by, in many cases, the same stakeholders. And I mean, you would have seen the public commentary on, you know, why is it that this fund is being accumulated and not being used to promote development, not being used to benefit the people. And so every day that the fund remains inoperable is a day that the people of Guyana are being denied the development opportunities that can flow from the resources of the fund being mobilized uh, to advance this development agenda. Let me hasten to add, of course, that the formula that we're contemplating is not one that will see the entire, all of the oil proceeds being transferred for the purposes of, um, of uh, uh, financing development in the current uh, generation because the fund does also address the intergenerational issues by ensuring that savings are accumulated over time and particularly as oil revenues um, ramp up the formula is designed it is designed to ensure that beyond a certain point as oil revenues ramp up and start to get really high that the bulk will be saved and that we'll only be using a certain level to finance development. Mm. So it also addresses the intergenerational issue. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, once discussions are held tomorrow, how soon can we see the implementation process of this happening? Of course, we're coming down to program time. Um, mm. And also, perhaps you might have some final comments to empower Guyanese that this is something that is beneficial to every single citizen so you can oh absolutely so what i would say is my my hope speaking as the incumbent minister responsible for finance my hope is that we can the opposition will in fact support this bill recognizing that operationalizing the nrf will redound to the benefit of the people of guyana my hope is that they will see good sense and support the bill and you know frankly you know, I will retain that hope until the very moment that the vote is taken tomorrow. Um, you know, even if their track record does not suggest that they, you know, have been a, a party uh, you know, interested in, in, in development and improving the well-being of people, I will still be optimistic and hope that we, they will vote in favor of the bill. And my hope subsequent to that would, would, would be that the bill would be operationalized as quickly as possible thereafter. You know, the, the steps that are required, uh, presidential assent, uh, uh, commencement order, and so on being issued. So my hope is that the bill will be brought, will be enacted, become an act, and will be brought into operation as soon as possible. And to the people of Guyana, I will say that what this bill, just like the, end, the local content bill, this is, notwithstanding that it represents just a few amendments, 
it represents a few critical amendments that in fact lays the foundation for the Natural Resources Fund to be deployed in pursuit of the cause of national development. And it potentially unlocks a portion, not all, but a portion of the resources in the fund over time. It put, the, these amendments lay the basis for a portion of the resources that we are earning from the oil and gas sector to be used to advance the development agenda. Everybody in Guyana wants better infrastructure. Everybody in Guyana wants better quality social services. These things don't drop from the sky. They have to be financed. And government financing comes either from taxes or from loans or grants. And there is a finite capacity to tax the economy. One does not. I mean, in fact, we don't want to overburden the economy with taxes. We don't want to overburden future generations with debt. And so financing this development agenda, what, you know, necessitates the unlocking of some portion of the Natural Resource Fund. And this bill lays the foundation for that to happen. Without, this bill lays the foundation for an, an accelerated development agenda to be implemented without overtaxing the people of Guyana and without straddling them with an unsustainable burden of debt. Thank you so much, Minister, for taking time out to be here, contextualizing both bills and what we can expect once enacted. I believe you provided a very critical and deep, deeper understanding for many on what these pieces of legislation mean for every single citizen. I thank you to you also, our listeners and viewers of this program. I am Travis Bruce.